Hey, hello everybody, good evening. Uh, sorry for this 10 minutes delay. Notwithstanding our efforts, we are in Italy, but next time we'll try to be on time. So welcome everybody to this uh, first session of the Tech Peaks Academy. Uh, we're very excited to, to start this program of sessions that are open to the public from our People Accelerator. Uh, we are doing this to make uh, uh, it possible to access our fantastic speakers and mentors for people who are in the local community here in Trento and for people who can follow us from remote uh, outside. So uh, tonight uh, we will have a very intense program with three speakers. Uh, the first one is Marco Senigaliesi. He is uh, uh, a business developer um, of uh, the European Institute of Technology, ICT Labs. He's going to introduce uh, what EIT ICT Labs is and what can do for you uh, in 15 minutes. And then later we have uh, um, two of our mentors uh, that came from all the way from Silicon Valley up to here uh, to talk about startups and investments and other things. So. Um, uh, founder market fit. So the first speaker will be uh, Marco Marinucci from Mind the Bridge, uh, and uh, he will speak about uh, venture capital and investment. And then uh, uh, Fadi Bishara, uh, co-founder of Black Box, and uh, who will speak about uh, founder market fit. Okay. So I leave the stage to Marco, and then later Marco and Fadi. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon. I have the hard task to warm you up within the, the next uh, the next speech. It's hard, but uh, I will try. Uh, EIT, European Institute of Technology. Uh, so do, you, do you hear that sounds like uh, MIT? EIT, MIT. Yes. It, it's not a case. Uh, we would like to replicate. Of course, it's not in a city. It's uh, widespread all over Europe. The European Institute of Technology. Uh, some years ago, uh, some um, guys of the European Union uh, thought that uh, uh, Europe need uh, to accelerate and to be more integrated, uh, more integrated among education, research, and business. Uh, we have a good education, we have a very good research, but sometimes all the business uh, got results not in Europe. So they decided to uh, create a structure to finance and to support the initiative that can uh, group and create a virtual circle of education, research and business that start and end in Europe. Uh, they uh, started to create free uh, kick so knowledge, uh, knowledge uh, community on climate, energy, and ICT. The one of, about ICT is EIT ICT Labs that you can see, can see the logo also here. And there are also others that are coming in the next years. Uh, the, the EIT ICT Labs uh, at the moment is present in uh, seven countries. Uh, Sweden, Finland, UK, Holland, Germany, France, and Italy, with a, a main node, and with a two uh, node of a lower rank. And basically, each node uh, is represented by a set of partners. And basically, in each node, uh, we could say that uh, EIT City Labs is like an empty box, and uh, these partners provide their efforts, their support to create a physical place. Yes, because differently from many other European uh, 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 initiatives, the EIT City Labs is an initiative that wants to create a co-location center, so a physical place where people meet, where ideas are exchanged. So uh, this is the main uh, Factor, one of the most important factor of this uh, uh, of this initiative. I want okay uh, before 
Uh, of course, uh, these uh, our uh, European Union initiative is connected with many others, like the Future Internet PPP program and the European Investment Fund. So we are connected with many other uh, European initiatives to uh, to create a networking. Uh, for instance, for more media enterprise last year, uh, we uh, supported some companies to develop their project on the future internet PPP. And at the moment we are also selecting company to collect funding from the European Investment Fund. Let's talk a bit about uh, the Trento node. Okay, these are uh, our partners. There are the core partners, Engineering, Telecom Italia and Trent Horizon. The Trend Horizon is an association that represents CreateNate, Fondazione Bruno Clay, Kessler, and the University of Trento. Then there are the, uh, university, the education partner, Politecnico Torino, Milano, Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna, University of Bologna, a research institution that is the National Council of Research, and some industrial partner, uh, Research Center of Fiat, Reply Post Italiane, and ST. Uh, each one of these uh, uh, partners uh, contribute uh, to the people that work in the node. For instance, I'm, I've, I've, uh, I've been hired by Trent Horizon. There are other business developers, one is in, is in this room and I'm going to present you uh, in a moment, is from Telecom Italia, another one from the Polytechnic of Milano. So this partner provides people to make the uh, to so that the ETCD labs is a, a living structure. Okay, there are many. I have a very uh, not many times, so I would like to focus on. Uh, okay, I'm a business developer, and uh, now I would like to show you how the business developer in Italy. There are five business developer, and there are 34 business developer all over Europe in the node that I showed you a moment ago. What do these business developers do? Uh, mainly for core activities. They support large industries. Large industries mainly the partners. There are partners in Italy, the, the partners I showed you a moment ago, but there are also the other in Europe like Siemens, uh, SAP, Nokia, Orange. How? We support them uh, letting them to know innovation available in Europe. You know that the large, large industries typically have their research department and they have their innovation program, but sometimes this, uh, this plan are very uh, not so fast to adapt to disruptive innovation. So they are very interested to know innovation developed by research centers or innovation developed by startups. So we provide them information about the most uh, disruptive innovation developed by, by university, research center, and uh, small medium enterprises. Then there are the support for small medium enterprises. In ICT, we have uh, a very fast uh, obsolescence. Uh, all of the innovation uh, tried to become obsolete very, very quickly. Uh, a company that, has, that was innovative in 2004, probably today, is completely obsolete. So we try to create opportunity for this company in Europe, if it is possible. But moreover, we try also to feed this, uh, this small, medium enterprise with the innovation developed by research centers, for instance. We try to we support startups, offering them uh, coaching, as well as the opportunity to increase their business in other countries and also to partner with uh, large enterprises, as I said a moment ago. So we support them, for instance, for travel uh, in another country to meet uh, large enterprises that are interested in the same field they are developing. Last, we, uh, we make a uh, 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 scouting activity in the research center. In Europe, there are many innovations that are uh, closed in the drawer. So they receive many uh, funding from European Union programs. They develop good innovation, but sometimes they are not used. 
So we make a scouting and make uh, this uh, uh, innovation avi available, we, available for me and for large industries. We uh, um, at the end we could say that the BDA team, the business development accelerator team, I'm a part of this team, is a hub. Hub among the small medium enterprise, entrepreneurs, funding opportunities, students, large industries, research centers, startups, universities, and events. Yes, because sometimes we support also startups to participate to events that uh, where they can be seen, they can collect networking and opportunities to uh, to enlarge their business. So uh, that's the reason I'm here, because uh, TechPix uh, is typically the one of the instruments uh, we we like uh, to feed our so-called funnel of selection of companies, because we. So that's the reason we are going to meet uh, with me and with the other business developer the next days, the next month so that we can know ourselves and when we see an opportunity for your company to partner with another company in Europe, another small medium enterprise or another startup that can partner with you for, for instance to uh, create a, a new innovative solution or perhaps uh, this company can uh, provide your uh, uh, can uh, can distribute your solution in their country. Uh, so that's the, our goal. Uh, our goal. The first step, of course, is to meet face to face. Is to meet and uh, to understand what is your business, what is the value, the value of your solution and uh, understand some basic uh, criteria. So the ambition to work on an international European level. Uh, it could be sound strange, but sometimes I have encountered companies, small medium enterprise or also startups, that told me, no, I'm satisfied about my regional business. OK, you have failed the first criteria, no problem. If you are happy, I wish you great success in your region. The business in line with, with one or more action line. I'm going to show you the action line of EIT City Labs are the priorities uh, defined by the EIT City Labs. But you are going to see that uh, our action line cover almost all the world of ICT. And, and then uh, the uh, high growth potential and real will. So we want to see people that is uh, with a strong uh, willing. Uh, about to uh, grow uh, on an international uh, level. And by the way, this is the mission of the ATCT Labs. The mission of the ATCT Labs is to support company to grow on a European level. So the business developer, for instance, are not going to help you, for instance, with other Italian company. No, it is not our role. Our role is to support you creating connection with other Opportun with opportunity in other country of Europe. <laughs> and these are the action lines. Uh, we have future cloud, cyber physical system, or uh, internet of and internet of thing. Future ne future networking solution that is a merge of two old uh, action lines. So you see that also ETC Labs is very, uh, is not uh, blocked in a strong uh, uh, matrix. We are changing our action line. We have decided that internet technologies and architecture and networking solutions for future media were too much connected. So we, we have merged them in only one action line. With that, we have the action line of health and well-being, the action line of privacy, security, and trust, the smart energy system, smart spaces, and urban life and mobility. That is the merging of two old phones. Uh, last year, uh, action line that are digital cities uh, and uh, intelligent mobility and transportation. Why? Because we have seen, for instance, that it is not possible to evaluate uh, a project uh, on digital cities without thinking about mobility. And it's not possible to think about mobility without thinking about the digital cities. I was talking about the funnel. 
yes, we talk with many companies. This is, the, this is our radar activity. Then we define the company with a real value. Then we propose them to other countries, to other business developers like us. We try to, to, to understand if there is an opportunity, for instance, for your company or for your company, to make a partner in another, in another country. To have the possibility, for instance, to create a legal entity, to make a partnership, to develop a new solution with another company, or, or simply to have a distribution channel. If we identify that there is a possibility, you became a coached company. So in this moment, you are uh, under the, uh, the supervision of two business developers, one in the origination country and one in the destination country. And if you sign an agreement with another company, with a, distribu with a distributor, uh, you create a legal entity in another country, you, you, you have revenues, <laughs> basically, that is the core of all the, the, of all the activities, uh, then you became, according to our uh, lexicon, a success story. We have a target of, of a certain number of success stories per year. These are useful slides. Okay. These are the bad faces, uh, or the ugly faces of the business developer. <laughs> and uh, Fabio, would you like to stand up so you can immediately see the? And I, okay, now it's, it's on the phone. <laughs> it's in the corner. But probably you have already seen uh, the other business developer in the bar camp or in other in other cases. They already been uh, around. Uh, so, uh, basically, uh, I just a final uh, uh, some points to, to close. Uh, on Monday, uh, a representative of uh, of the alpinist companies are are invited in uh, Povo in, in our uh, collocation center to meet uh, to make a, a two minute pitch, just two minute. Uh, in front of a representative of the other European node. And the European node, I'm going to pitch in front of you, uh, presenting the opportunities of their environment in the other country. And then you have the possibility to network with them. This is uh, on Monday, and uh, I think that uh, Paolo and the, uh, and the staff is going to uh, identify the representatives of uh, each uh, Alpinist company. On, uh, May 21st, we are going to have uh, um, uh, another meeting with two uh, industrial uh, representatives from uh, two companies that are Reply and Emaze, that are company, large company involved on privacy, security, and trust. By the way, one of the uh, speakers uh, is also, has also created free startups, and they are going to show you the importance of uh, uh, security in their application, in their solution, uh, making, presenting many examples of uh, how a failure could be completely uh, uh, a drama for, uh, for a startup, and, uh, and suggesting you uh, a, 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 a right uh, approach to developing security for your application and your customers. So, see you on May 12, a sample of you, and all of you on uh, uh, 21st of May. It's all for me. Thank you. Paolo <laughs> disappeared? Exactly, in the moment I am, but no problem. Well, we have already, we have the next speaker uh, ready. Let's call us Thanks, Marco, for the there are quite some opportunities with the IDS City Lab, so I warmly invite you to follow the website and follow the back so we can introduce the next speaker. All right, sorry, I was getting the Mac connector for making this happen. Uh, thank you, Marco. Thank you. Sorry, I, I was no problem. working on this. And. Come here, we connect your laptop in the, in the meantime. So, uh, 
very brief presentation because uh, uh, Matt Marinucci will introduce himself better than what I can do. Uh, uh, so uh, Matt Marinucci is the founder of MindBridge. Uh, MindBridge has been one of uh, the initiatives in uh, the Italian uh, startup scene uh, that started the first and helped to grow uh, the startup scene in Italy by, by bringing uh, the culture of Silicon Valley to Italy. Uh, and uh, he's helped us for many years now also to start the startup scene in Trento. So he has a lot to tell us about the art of venture financing. Uh, financing. Thank you, Marco, for being here. <laughs> so clearly the speaker before me must have been very popular because there are three times the amount of people that we had uh, up until half an hour ago. Um, so anyways, welcome. Uh, I would like to do this. How much time do we have? 45 minutes? Yes. 45 minutes. So, um, again, I would like to do this as interactive as possible. Again, thanks everybody for coming. I'm going to uh, be focusing especially with the uh, folks and the founders uh, here hosted at uh, Tech Peaks. So, you know, I'll keep them in mind as the focus of my conversation. So, please, let's keep it open as a conversation. Uh, what I was planning to talk about. Um, probably one of the toughest topics that you're going to address in the next uh, few weeks. So how to be relevant for an investor at the end of the day. And uh, even more than that, um, I'm going to talk about the harsh reality of a demo day. Um, and so we're going to address some of their, you know, redress some of the expectations also there. And it's better to do it well, well in advance than the day before, as I did probably last time, uh, a, few, a few days before. So those are a couple of topics that I would like to address. Uh, but again, I'm going to start real quick more on you know, kind of the process of venture funding in general. And I would like to get you guys involved in this discussion. So I kind of uh, uh, focus the presentation more uh, alongside um, of, uh, of your real needs. Let me stop one second first. And, and uh, I think I asked this question before to a small amount of people. but. Uh, how many of you knew where Trento was before Tech Peaks? Two people. All right. <laughs> How many of you know where Trento is today? All right. All right. So that's, that's the first. Uh, that's the first objective reached with uh, for for Tech Peaks. Uh, I was here back in 93, 94, and a little bit of 95, if I'm not correct. Um, Ray told the story uh, with you guys at study. I did my dissertation here uh, at the what it was called the EARS at the time, the Technology uh, Institute of Research. Um, in stuff that are kind of actually real today, like 20 years later, we're literally talking about 20 years, uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So I spent, in fact, most of that time, 15 years later, working at Google, where the real artificial intelligence is actually, you know, not everybody is following today. Uh, but that's kind of my background, just to uh, give you a sense um, of what I've been, been doing in the last uh, in the last few years. Um, so I studied here, I graduated as an engineer, studied uh, artificial intelligence. Then I got involved into the uh, kind of a startup world. Uh, back in the day, the old good days of the dot-com uh, in the late 90s, where everything was easy eventually to bring home. Uh, and then so I did a few startups uh, between here and uh, in fact was uh, UK ended up in, in Spain and uh, and finally France and then from Spain from France I ended up in Silicon Valley and to me Silicon Valley was just this remote you know place uh, that wasn't even interesting to me you know I wanted to go explore think places that to me kind of you know were a little bit more you know, closer to what I. Uh, my explorer in me was looking for, uh, but yet I ended up in Silicon Valley, and uh, and to me it was kind of a you know having a vision, you know, if you work in, uh, in startups and then uh, you know coming into the promised land eventually. Uh, so definitely something that I, I didn't expect. So I ended up staying, um, and and today that this is actually the place where I spend at the most uh, amount of time. So I was there, I, I landed there in 2004, no, sorry, 2001, 2004 I started working with Google. I was fortunate enough of leaving, you know, the, 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 the development of Google from kind of a decent sized startup, uh, pre-IPO, going IPO in fact, 
to the company that you guys know today. So 45, whatever, 1,000 people. I lost count when I left. When I, when I joined Google, there were 2,000 people. So kind of, you know, still a decent-sized company, for especially for Italian standards. But it wasn't the large company that you see before. So uh, you know, through Google, I have the option of seeing you know, the dynamics of uh, how a company moves from kind of a one product-centric entity into you know, this large you know, entity that we all, we all use. But back in those days, I started working with uh, kind of supporting startups. I started uh, eventually what uh, it became a foundation, so it's not for profit. Uh, Mind the Bridge, 2007, and Mind the Bridge is, it still is, uh, you know, a foundation that is focused on education uh, on entrepreneurship. So the first focus has been startups. And in fact, the first focus was startups from Italy. So give the founders, the Italian founders, actually have the, the you know the most relevant talent and idea an option to develop their business uh, in Silicon Valley and plug them with the a network uh, of uh, mentors that had done it before. And the first realization was actually in fact to meet a community of people that is totally invisible for here for the title of people that maybe. You know, moved there 30 years ago, 40 years ago. They still read Correa de la Sera every day. They still check the, you know, soccer matches every Sunday night. Uh, but they are, you know, by all means, are full Americans, and they've created, you know, a few of the largest companies and most uh, relevant companies or entity is in Silicon Valley, and nobody knows about them here. So that was kind of a realization of a missing link. Uh, that you know, when I was back here, I wanted to look for uh, really a role model, a positive role model, that you know, to whom I could kind of relate, to people kind of study at a similar university that kind of had the same issues that I had, and then eventually made it big. So started companies like Logitech of the world, two Italians, uh, that created, uh, like the you know, invented the first uh, uh, um, artificial insulin. <laughs> so companies that there are, you know, large entities, and uh, and uh, and are kind of the pillars of some of the developing Silicon Valley. Nobody, a very few people knew about them from here. So that was kind of the first realization. That's when I started Mind the Bridge as a foundation, really with a focus of connecting these dots. And so that's that's a program that over over the years developed into a number of activities, a number of uh, uh, programs. Now, uh, six years into it, we graduate uh, in our, some of our programs. The main one is the startup school, uh, where they run pretty much every month. In three weeks, we kind of give uh, support uh, with a kind of a scheduled um, program to startups that are kind of in the scaling phase. <laughs> and we, um, we support probably a dozen startups a month. And we graduate probably you know, now. 100, 120 companies per year. We also work with uh, angels and with large corporations. So with angels, again, we kind of uh, do uh, the same, the same similar support. So we run classes where we actually teach them uh, what is uh, an investment thesis, and some of the stuff that I'm just going to give you an introduction uh, today, because it can be pretty boring unless you really have to go there and define the terms of investment. I also work with companies, and uh, so one of the things that we've started working uh, in the last six months, in fact, is to connect the large entities with you guys, with the startups. So to kind of uh, fill in the gap that today is pretty evident, especially in Europe, where the large corporations live in a world that is very separate from the startups, and startups are totally detached from the, from the commercial world of entities that actually need them. Uh, to uh, support their innovation. But even more than that, uh, you need them, you startup need them to have a potential exit strategy. Right? So we're going to talk about this in a minute. But you know, the one thing that we mentioned today when I was doing introduction is that the biggest difference between Silicon Valley and any other place in the world uh, in those terms is, you guys heard it before, what is it? Um, like potential exit. Potential, potential exit. In the fact that uh, most of the acquisitions at different levels, especially at the early stage, still happen in this small uh, land with uh, you know 80 miles uh, um, in Silicon Valley. So the huge, the biggest difference uh, uh, in terms of uh, macroeconomical differences in, in the ecosystem is that in Silicon Valley there is a potential for your startups to be acquired. 
So there is a potential for me as an investor to make some money out of you, right? So with no exit strategy, there is no gain. You know, the whole idea of investing in startups doesn't make any sense. That's why it's more complicated actually to be an investor in a place like Italy or Europe in general because it's very hard after I invest money in your entity to see a potential return, right? So, and that is the main reason, the only reason why an investor invests in a startup because it's a better return than doing any other kinds of investment. Okay, so we're going to talk about this in a minute. And so back in uh, a, a few years ago, I started doing some investment at the angel level, uh, very early stage. And then two years ago, I set up a little fund where uh, we do a dozen investments per year. Started last year, and now we have uh, 14 or 15 investments so far uh, with companies that are, to some extent, international companies that are lending in Silicon Valley. So we help them with the localization of their business there. Yeah. Uh, I also do some other stuff. I work with the Instituto de Empresa Business School and I'm a board member and uh, I do some, some blogging and some writing. But even more importantly, I'm a happy father of two. Um, all right, so let's, let's go back to the, the harsh reality. This is potentially you had a demo day. <laughs> can, you, can you share what's the demo day? Okay, so demo day <laughs> is this painful end of a process where you're supposed to show how beautiful you are. Right? You're graduated, you know, you're you know, showing your wings. Uh, so the, the demo day is typical when you do your pitching, the thing that you've been you know, hallucinating uh, for uh, the, the, the previous three, four, six months. Okay? So you feel so much pressure because everything, you know, start today, say, okay, my demo day is, when is your demo day? I would say it's July 18th. Everybody is invited. Right? Okay, July 18th. So you're already talking about now about this freaking date of July 18th that feels <laughs> so far in the future. So demo days eventually, you know, the expectation that you guys have about these demo days are huge, right? Because it's kind of, you know, I'm graduating. Look at this. I became this. Uh, the reality is not exactly like this. So one of the things that I, I want to share with you is that. Most of us, people like Fadi, how many demo days do you see per month? <laughs> yeah. right? So you're talking, you're, people get overloaded with demo days. So it's even more difficult for you to get noticed, which is the one thing that we mentioned today. So you're here in two minutes, what is the one thing that you want to bring home? To get noticed. So to, to be able then to have a follow-on discussion with the people that you kind of you know, see as a fit, as potential investor. So the one thing that you need to be quite quite clear about is it's it's very hard uh, it's very hard to have a you know in your demo day you know to find to have any deal sign um, is the norm that it is more and more that people come there because they are you know asked to come there but then eventually you know this is the beginning of a process that can go on for the following months okay so just to 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 strike the right balance of, of your expectations. Um, the other thing is that you know people get overloaded, so you need to be very selective in what you're saying, and especially the kind of people that you want to see. So there's a lot of homework that you have to do on your side, understanding who's coming, uh, the the smart money that would come, that would potentially come, potentially not because your project project is not the best, but potentially won't come to you. So it's actually very nice what you said. Why don't we we talk business? So it's on your side, especially at this stage of development, to do a lot of homework. And typically, this is the life of the CEO of the company for the following X months. And X is as big as you know, uh, uh, how good you are. Because the fundraising will suck up most of your time as a CEO. So be ready for that. Because if you don't feel that that's you know, your kind of life, you're probably doing the wrong, the wrong thing. But fundraising at that stage is going to be kind of a full-time job, at least a good 50% of your of the CEO time for X amount of months. Okay, so this starts before it starts with a, a thorough, uh, you know, market research, knowing understanding the people that are coming. So you need to study. You need to study weeks in advance and kind of understand what is their background and how of a potential fit these people can be for what you do. So there's a lot of homework that people tend to underestimate before they go to them. Okay. So don't focus just on your, you know, nice life and try to, you know, to deliver the best message with the right, you know, <laughs> smile. But uh, there is a homework that has to be done 
way earlier than that. All right, so uh, before we go uh, to more of the um, dynamics there, let me understand a little bit more of uh, your understanding of the investment process. Uh, how many of you guys are here talking to the startups of this batch have already dealt with the investors in general? Four people? Five people? OK. How many of you have seen uh, a, um, a term sheet? Three people? Four people? OK. So the, the group is getting smaller. What's a term sheet? Exactly. That's the right question. Um, all right, so a term sheet is kind of your exactly, exactly summary of an investment. OK, kind of like what you do. I'm not giving you 200 pages of, uh, of contract right away. I give you my you know, exactly summary of the kind of an offer that I'm going to make you. All right, so that's as part of your process of negotiating, this is you know, the, a good sign, meaning that there is people that are actually interested in, the, in, the, in going for, further in your due diligence. Uh, and that's the first step in saying, OK, those are kind of the macro terms that I would like to apply to you guys. All right, let, let me do another step back. Because here, with the five people that actually answered that and some of that. Um, did you guys still dealt with uh, angel investors or, or VCs? Angels. Angels? Anybody else? OK. All right, so for, for the one person that dealt with the VC, who's the guy? What guy? Who, who talked to VCs before? Not with money. Talk, talk, talk. Are oh, you talking this? Okay, two people. All right, so we got this smaller and smaller, always in this corner. So I might actually move on this side to talk to you guys. <laughs> All right, so do you have any sense how a VC firm works? Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, there's a camera. I'm going to be moving like things. Sure. Like, Don't worry. Um, so do VCs invest their own money? Yeah. Do VCs invest their own money? No. No? Whose money are they investing? Basically, uh, you know, you, they raise a fund from uh, different entities. Private investors, uh, institutional investors. When they have this fund, then they go scouting for talent startups and in turn invest that fund with startups. Usually, I think in the US, we see uh, raise money from big and uh, uh, like universities. And yeah, yeah. So basically, they manage other people's money, invest in startups, and give them a return. There you go. Was that clear for everybody? Thanks for that. You are the pro in the room here. So typically, uh, kind of a mature investors, VC, do not does not invest their own money. I mean, actually, they're, they're supposed to invest at least one percent of the fund, but this is typically you know third party money. So, and the people are giving money to them to manage are, as I mentioned, and US is very common uh, to be endowments. You guys know what our endowments are? No, well, those are so one of the structure. Most of universities in US are. Uh, most of their budget is actually covered by the way that they manage this endowment. An endowment is like a fund where third parties, especially alumni, put money to support the university. And so a good amount of their uh, operational <coughs> budget is actually covered by the returns of those investments of this fund. So those are uh, the, the reason why I'm giving you these kind of references is because without that, it's very hard for you to have a conversation uh, and a negotiation where you actually understand your power and what these people are, uh, um, you know, pressed for. Okay. So the one thing that they need to do is that they need to bring returns. Okay. So if I give you the money, I don't do it because I'm doing a donation. That's a different kind of a business. It's because I want to see returns, and potentially your returns are better than buying a building and selling it, whatever is available. Okay. So this is kind of the pressure that a VC is under. Uh, you mentioned the idea of, of the fund. Do you guys know what is a fund as, a, as an entity, a structure? What is it? When we say there is a fund, what is it? A pot of money available. A amount of money available, yeah. Yeah. But what is it? I mean, from a, from a corporate, corporate point of view, do you know what is a fund? Is that just a, a bank account? No, it, it's related to a purpose. Your purpose. Who says it's a company? Me. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Me. <laughs> it's a company. Yeah. It's an entity. It's a legal entity per se. And so, when a, a, a VC manages a fund, you know what that means in terms of a 
you know, what is the relationship between the, a VC and the fund that he manages? No? All right. So ideally, a, a fund, or typically not ideally, a fund is an entity that has a beginning and an end. Correct? So that means that as, after a certain time, by regulation, I need to close that fund. I need to return the money to the guys that gave me initial money you know, in the first place. Okay? And do you, you know how long is that period, General? Five years. Did you say? Five years. Five, what's more? Ten years. Ten years? Who said ten years? <laughs> they won a prize. So typically it's ten years, can be a little bit more, a little bit less. But typically the life cycle of a fund is ten years. That means that a, a VC, a, ma a manager of a fund, would spend the first part of these five years doing what? Investing. And the second part? <laughs> Try to exit this investment. So there's a pressure not to put your money indefinitely, but to put the money in you knowing that, you know, two years, five years from now, I need to this, get this money back or exit this investment. Okay? So every time I talk to a, an investor, a VC in this case, I always talk to somebody that when he looks at me, he knows, okay, I've got three years to exit from this investment. I've got five years, I've got seven years. So it's crucial for you when you talk to investors, understand at what stage of the fund they are now, okay? Because if you talk to them at year number eight, you're probably wasting your time, right? Because at year number five, potentially, all their fund is invested, let's say, say is deployed. And then they have the remaining amount of years to try to exit those investments. So one of the first things that you should be doing when you talk to people that are managing this fund is to understand at what level of development the fund is. Okay? Yes? Very realistically, most uh, startups, especially in acceleration, they don't even get to weak conversation. That's the reality of the... Yeah, true. It's also true that uh, this would happen probably in the U.S. Here, you know, in, in, in Silicon Valley, every investor, this is a, you know, a, a market is much more mature, it's been alive since the, you know, probably 100 years now. Uh, started, yeah, in the, in the late 40s or more. Um, um, uh, the, today, I mean, in, in, in Silicon Valley, there are, every fund is very specialized. So they do from A to B. They do exactly that amount of uh, activity at that maturity of the company. In other markets, specifically here, there are a lot of uh, entities, a lot of funds that do from seed to growth capital, to Series D and 10 plus. So chances are that the people that we'll see in your demo day would actually under the same pressures. So it will be people that probably do even the 100,000 in investment which probably in Silicon Valley would be considered a typical uh, you know, angel investment, but they do it under a structure of a VC. So the kind of the dynamics that you guys will see are kind of similar to, uh, to what any you know, VC you know, investor would, uh, would, would be in. Okay? So that's the one thing that you should check. So the, kind of the background of the, of the fund, the stage of maturity of their funds, and typically a VC would manage funds, multiple funds at a time. Okay, so rather than expecting the whole period of investing of, uh, of the 10 years, and if I'm smart enough, I have a, a good track record at year five, I will start a new fund, right? So typically I've got, you know, one fund that is at the second phase of the investment and I start a new fund. So, but those are information that you should find, right? So you should, more and more the investment process is becoming more and more transparent, which is good, because before, even up until Five ten years ago, everything was kind of opaque. So it was kind of hard to, uh, to see the returns of potential fund. It was kind of hard to see how big a fund was. It was kind of hard to see, you know, kind of the, the kinds of investment that the people were doing. Today, with the uh, entities like AngelList, have you guys heard of AngelList? Raise your hand. Okay, so if you haven't, uh, it's time to do some homework tonight because AngelList is kind of like a LinkedIn for you as a professional, especially in the US. It just actually landed in, in Europe. So especially at your stage of development, having a nice profile on AngelList when you have a product in the market is today's essential. 
I mean, is kind of key to your potential development as a, also uh, to, to fundraise. Uh, so, so we're talking about VC now. The other piece, you know, the kind of the other counterparty you deal with are angel investors. And to some extent, actually, angel investors for you are a much easier counterpart to deal with. Why is that an idea? Was that easier for you to deal with an angel investor? Entrepreneurs. They're entrepreneurs, yeah. And most of the you know, VCs, especially in the US, are ex entrepreneurs. They've done it three or four times and then return uh, on the other side of the field. What else? They might be more flexible and have knowledge in the market that you need. That's very true. Why, why do you say more flexible? Well, it's like one person and it's their own money. And like this, it's much more flexible. Funds have revelations, probably they have boards of decision making process. That you nailed it. That's exactly the point. So for you, it's a much easier kind of conversation because an angel, as he said, doesn't have a lot of uh, regulation, so typically invest his own money, and you know they don't have a term. They don't have people of third party they need to manage and get back, right? So even if your company turn into, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, the worst situation possible, which is not closing down. What is the worst situation possible that can happen to you as a startup? You don't get customers. Yeah, they don't get customers. That's pretty bad. <laughs> what else? Run out of money? Yeah, that's not. They typically close down when you run out of money. So, game over. You go home. You know, depending on the time. Be a zombie. <laughs> yes, you'll say the zombie. There you go. You want it. I wish I had something to give you. Be a zombie. <laughs> this is the worst situation possible. <laughs> because you're kind of a lot. You turn into, you know, for a potential potential big business you turn into a small business into you know kind of a family you can listen this and return if this business as a as a family business but not interesting for for investors investors want to see high re results high returns right so the worst situation possible for an investor is that you turn into a zombie so you're kind of profitable but you don't die which is you know at the end of the day at least is a clear sign that this is a write off and you're not going to become big. So I got, I'm kind of stuck because my money is there and, uh, and I don't see any potential return. So that's the worst situation possible for an investor to look at you and you'll become a zombie five years from now. Okay? For an angel investor, that's a little bit less of a problem because typically as an angel, I can stay in, your, in your, you know, the equity of your company maybe for 10 years, 15 years. I don't really care at the end of the day. Huh? I can you know, kind of get dividends if I care. A VC does not have that freedom, that ability to turn into a, a longer term coming investor. So this is uh, going to definition. Those are kind of a definition. So those are the guys that at your stage you want to talk to. Uh, so high net, net worth individuals. Um, kind of in every country has different rules, but uh, in the US, for example, there is a clear definition. So when, when I'm an angel, I sign a deal with you, I kind of uh, certify that I'm uh, you know, I'm a net, I net um, a worth individual that knows what I'm doing, and typically in US, I think the you know the definition you need to, to have at least one million uh, dollars to invest. You know that doesn't you know as high net net worth that doesn't include your house, for example, and some other stuff that you need to prove. Right. So this is kind of a definition. Uh, then today, by the way, the, the crowdfunding. Um, um, platforms are totally dis disintermediate, so are totally changing the structure of investment. But you know, this is still kind of the definition of an angel. Typically, they've been entrepreneurs, as you mentioned, in that kind of area, and they are kind of passionate about helping hands-on in what you're doing. So you know, your best uh, fit is to find people that actually been active in your market, uh, understanding your you know issues that you're going through as uh, as an entrepreneur. Any idea with this guy? Paper. You're a pro. <laughs> <laughs> Are you from Silicon Valley? No. no. All right. Yes, this is Draper. Draper is kind of a the quintessential in the, in the 
there are thousands of these things. But it's interesting because it's, uh, first of all, it looks like Superman. So I actually, <laughs> if you go and search him on YouTube, there's actually great uh, videos when he's actually dressed up as Superman. So it goes like that. I don't know if you've seen that. But it's, it's a, a third generation of VCs. His sons and daughter of VCs, and potentially the next generation again will be VCs, or whatever VC will will be 10 years from now, which is something that's, by the way, totally different, because the market is, is really changing. But it's a kind of a quintessential of VC. So typically, he runs a, a multi multiple funds. So typically, as I mentioned before, running, having under management, that's how you say, a number of funds. Um, um, and those are, as I mentioned before, VC is a, is a financial institution. Financial institution that needs to bring results to initial investors. Um, there are a number of, uh, of technically, a, a number of VCs. Um, the one kind of VC that today uh, is getting back into kind of good fashion are the corporate VCs. You guys can name some corporate VCs. Telefonica. Again? Telefonica? Yeah, Telefonica is a corporate VC. What else? There is one that is actually Google. Google Thank you. Thank you. What else? Uh, Google Bank. Corporate VCs that are kind of for sound. No? All right, you guys do, as part of the homework, do a little study of a top VCs. Because to have a conversation and eventually with an investor, you need to show that you know your stuff, right? You need to show that you've done a little bit of your homework. And as I said before, it requires a lot of uh, you know, study prior. And there are thousands of investors. You are the ones that actually need to see who's the fit. And so you start from the top. You need to understand who are the top VC firms that have been doing cool stuff. Uh, and then down to your territory, you know, somebody that is actually relevant in, in, uh, in, in the world that you're in. Okay. So uh, Google Ventures, for example, is a pretty relatively um, uh, new corporate ventures. It's actually structured in a totally different way. They have uh, you know, evergreen funding. You guys know what is evergreen funding? No? Meaning that you go to Papi and they give you money you know, when, when it's needed. So you don't have to do fundraising outside. You don't have a you know, 10-year period. You just go when you need cash, they're going to uh, fill that. Uh, and this is actually has a good number of uh, corporate VCs today work. Uh, the reason why they do investment as a corporate VC sometimes is, is different from, uh, from why you know, traditional VC do, do their business. Traditional VC do their business because they need to return money to the initial, initial investors. Corporate VCs typically have different dynamics. Most of the time they're actually doing scouting for a company for entities that make sense in their corporation. And not necessarily that they are measured on their return on investment. Okay? So that's another thing that you guys should uh, should study before you approach some some VCs. What about the networking? Apart from money, so are angels more effective in networking you, or are more venture capitalists and more effective? In so that actually leads me to the to the next slide. Uh, and so there are multiple metrics that you can use to define what investment discussion you're having. This is one that's kind of a politically correct. There's another one that is less politically correct. That is uh, smart money versus dumb money. So smart money are the people where I mean, you go to, and typically, you know, the financial side is important, but it's not the main reason why I'm, I'm coming to you. You're buying into the network. You're buying into the corporate development of a company. I can name at least a dozen companies that eventually have raised VC money that is actually selling the bank. I was talking to the founder of Crazy uh, two weeks ago. They raised money, he raised money, it was profitable as plenty of cash, but yet they raised money because they know they were buying into a partner that eventually will help them develop strategy, business development, the team. This is actually crucial. And everything that, that, that followed that. Okay? So again, these are expectations that you have, especially when you know you are there and you have the 
the opportunity to look for you know the best fit for you. This is not you know the situation in general. You're there desperately looking for funding. That's kind of the average. Uh, uh, you may come into a situation where you're actually in a very good position in, in negotiating. So you can actually go and look for the best fit. Uh, and typically, you look for what we call smart money in that sense, that the, where the financial side is, is really minor. It's not the main reason why. As I said, this is another way to look at the kind of sources. So uh, here on the you know the, the timing of where I'm doing I'm doing fundraising, um, and it is you know a kind of uh, giving equity away or not giving equity away, right? So typically, this is probably where pretty much all of you are. Actually, some of you already raised some money, but this is the typical beginning, what we call bootstrapping, right? So when you put your boots on and you're you're you know surviving with your the funds. That you have, you've done your families, you've done your own funds, you, you're moving to your friends, and then you're looking for the, the third F, which is, which is fools. fools, right? So you do friends, families, and fools. Those are the typical, the typical sources of the of the bootstrapping. Then typically you move to the next level when you do equity financing, meaning that you're giving away a little piece of your company in return of a of a of funding. Now, typically, that goes to I think of what is called today Series A. Series A is kind of the first official, you know, VC investment that is a little bit more mature, right? And then you can go, you know, later stage, and so you can add multiple series of investment. It goes Series A, Series B, Series C, and so on and so forth, into you know the maturity, the growth stage of the company, where you know the kind of investments are in the hundred million dollars, okay? And especially lately, you know, if you see what happened with the investment with Facebook, for example, before they went public, I don't know if you saw some of that, but the investments of the VCs at that stage were in the hundred million, right? So into almost kind of a private equity kind of deals, right? So this is you know, more mature uh, investments, but still giving away equity. And then there are other forms of uh, financing. We're not going to talk about this. This is the world of banks and the world of uh, you know financial institutions that give you loans, right? So we want to see. I've got ten minutes. Okay. All right. So that's how it works. This is essentially what I, I told you before. This is when you start a fund. A fund is essentially an institution, okay? And so uh, a venture capital firm has under management a number of funds. Tell me some names of some of the largest VC firms that you might have heard of. The Coyote. The That's always the first one that comes out. Oh. Number two. Another. <coughs> Great luck. Do you have any idea of the size of how much they have under management? Size. Just to give a sense of the range. 800 million. I don't know if it's that much, but it's definitely in, in the in the billions, if not hundred billions. Right? Any idea? Tell me some of the Italians here. Who's the probably the largest VC in Italy? Who can tell me? Who said that? I said you're not supposed to talk. <laughs> <laughs> what is the three sixty? Yeah, yeah. So just to give you a sense, how, do you know how big is their fund under management? Again, take it on living, just to get a sense of how much is under management. Any taker? Ten million. Ten million. No, that's, that would be a little bit too. Uh, <laughs> that's a serious company there. Yeah, a little more. Fifty million. Fifty. No, it's actually that maybe a hundred million. Uh, now it's a little bit less, but th those are kind of the ranges. So. Literally, you know, the range can vary a lot. So, you know, it can be the sequoias of the world. We're talking the hundred billions into. The world. So, typically, a single fund, as uh, as I mentioned before, uh, a time expiration. So, you need to know when is this fund expiring. And if everything goes well, I've got potential financial actions out of the investment. So, typically. I've got a fund number one, I invest into 20 startups, typically 60 go bust, so I know those are right off. I've got the 20 zombies that I don't know how to kill, but I, I mean, if I'm good enough, I've got 
two or three maybe you know good exits that produce financial returns. What do I do with the financial returns? Any idea? You turn you return to your investors and you know I keep Investigate. some of that. I keep I keep some of that. Do you any idea what is the split? Uh, how much do I return to initial investors versus how much am I keeping for myself? That's a different thing, yes. That's very true. Yeah. So say again, what is that? That's the fund management fee. The fund management fee. So typically a VC firm pays the salaries, the lights, the buildings, the expenses, what is called the management fee. Okay? And the management fee, as pretty much all the financial institutions, are around the, you know, two percent, depending on the size of the fund. You know, one one of five to two percent. So you can actually make the math how much these guys have to pay their salaries, right? which is, I think, is a good understanding of how, what kind of pressure they are. But typically, if they're good, the money, the real money they're making, are making if they are successful in having returns from the startups. Because typically, with a management fee, you pay the expenses. You don't make much money. What is the? How, do you know how much you split the returns from the startups if everything goes fine? So if your startups sell for 100 million, how much do I give back to the? Uh, the, the people are investing in the fund are called LPs, limited partners. Any idea what's the split? I think uh, the best returns, like the best ones, give about 25 to 30 percent return on uh, what they have raised. <laughs> No, that's a difficult. That's a difficult question. Is what's the overall return of funds? It's all over the map, and you will never find those those numbers uh, ever, right? Because it's all kind of mixed up and difficult. Now I'm asking a much easier question. How do the um, the returns are getting from the uh, M&A of the companies? How much do I give back to the limited partners versus how much do I keep as a VC firm? No, no idea. 50-50? Yeah. 80-20? Who, who say 80-20? <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? Are you, are you Googling? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it is 80-20. So who gets 80, who gets 20? Yeah, so I give the vast majority to them and then typically... Uh, so that's kind of the, the dynamics of that. Five minutes, okay. Uh, and so we, we, I think it's important. The reason why I'm telling you this data, because if you don't quite understand what is the dynamics of a firm, it's very hard then for you to to have a conversation where also the kind of the terms are given to you are clear, and you get a sense of why they're asking to get their money back two years from now, for example, right? So this is how it works. So typically, yes, in 20, 80, 20, uh, what they keep within the firm is called the. Um, the, the carried interest, that's what is it, the technical name. Let me see how many other. Okay, I'm going to go real quick because there's one piece that I wanted to, sh to share with you that, that I think is important. Uh, this is the typical. The two more, more slides I think are crucial for you. Number one, you spend most of the time deciding. Uh, devaluation when you deal with a with an investor, this is actually at your stage is that it shouldn't be the problem, okay? Because you are too focused on the value, and, and at that stage it doesn't really matter if it's a million or if it's five million. Seriously, <coughs> and I know that you feel like you know giving away a piece of your company, but it, the the question should be asked later on, because that can take forever. So typically in a world of uh, more mature investments, if you're done business school, you do a lot of you know financial projections. You do, uh, you know, you calculate, you calculate what is the future uh, value of my free cash flow that I'm producing at your stage. But even three or four years from now, it will be impossible to have that calculation. So eventually, the all boils down to one thing: is negotiation. So really, the value that you're getting out of your transaction is when even you're more mature. Is that typically if you have two bidders. So today we talked about Glancy, right? I mean, the typical situation, the best solution for deciding your valuation is to find two bidders. So to find another entity that somehow is interested in either invest in you or, or buying you. So that's where the value really goes to the to the roof, right? Um, so why is that 
uh, so difficult? And then what, what is the other possibility to that? This is what is the standard silicon value? And finally, little by little, is also you know coming out of uh, the states. The convertible notes. So typically, at your level, rather than deciding, okay, my company is worth one million, you just don't go through that process. That can be painful, time-consuming, resource-consuming. So the one thing that you normally use, and this is why convertible notes have, have become so popular, is because you push the whole process of evaluation back, I mean, ahead of time. I mean, you push it in into a moment where your business is much more mature. So I can do kind of financial projection, I have a sense, I have a proxy of a company that got acquired, that kind of does my same business, so I've got some comparables, right? So the reason, the idea of a convertible notes is that I give you money today, it's actually a loan. I loan you money today, and I have the option, you know, to recall my money back, typically in a year or in 18 months, with the potential of an interest. You have a question? <laughs> this is a very good question. This is a very good question. I'll open our European investors in. This is part of the learning process. It's one more reason why we run an angel school in there to give you a sense of what is the market today. What makes sense to negotiate one loan? So I started to see, for example, in Italy, the angel groups are starting using convertible notes. This is something very recent. But it's part of you pushing for it, the market asking for it. Uh, you know, it, it, to some extent is a no-brainer because you don't spend months in doing a due diligence at a stage where it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I loan you the money today with a possibility of calling them back with an interest. So typically there is a, an interest um, sometimes. But this is not the reason why I'm giving you money. I'm giving you money because I actually believe that I want to stay in your company, mm -hmm. but I don't know how much I uh, to value them. So the idea of devaluation is pushed into when there is a financial event. And a financial event is typically either a, an investment that is kind of mature in the millions or is an exit, right? When there is that event, then I calculate backwards the equity that, that, I, that I kind of uh, take, I took out of my initial investment at a maturity date or during the, uh, the financial event. And typically, I do it with a discount. So if the you know, valuation is one million, you know, I, I took more risk because I entered a year before, and so I take a discount to that evaluation. That's kind of the that's a kind of the process. All right, I know that I'm, I'm running out of time, so uh, that's kind of the message I wanted to leave you with. Uh, yeah, today, the good news is that uh, you know, corporate lawyers can cost a lot of money, but there are a lot of uh, free resources in the web. Uh, this is just a subset. You can have uh, multiple more in your, in your own language. So the idea and the good news about the market is that you know that kind of investment is becoming somehow easier. So you find a lot of open source, a lot of accelerators actually put posting their uh, you know some of the convertible notes totally uh, to the masses. So that's a good starting point for you guys um, to you know to go through the early stage investment process. All right, I'm done. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Very much. So th this was pretty interactive. So um, I, we, we, Marco used all of the time, uh, but we can take one question in case there's one. Okay, great. Uh, we appreciate. So uh, we'll give the same. Thank you, Marco, again. Where it's really a pleasure to have Fadi here. Uh, he's had, uh, uh, well, he's been living in the Silicon Valley for many, many years uh, and uh, all around the US. Uh, he'll tell us uh, more uh, about him himself. He's now uh, the founder of uh, Blackbox. Uh, that is an early stage investor and he is helping entrepreneurs from all over the world to uh, to to get value out of Silicon Valley and uh, with uh, many contacts and a two weeks long intensive very intensive program. So Fadi, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you. So much. Okay, we have, we have some technical difficulties.
something's off, right? Can you adjust my screen now? It's just looking not right. Um, I'm not a Mac user, but there are many here. Is okay, there okay. Yeah. Oh, I think maybe I'm, I'm getting it. All right. right. Yeah, that's here good. Okay, yeah. that's better. Great. So thank you for being here. It's a great honor to be here. It's always a pleasure to meet fantastic entrepreneurs and all the people who are interested in this uh, <coughs> game of entrepreneurship, building companies, creating value, creating jobs, and 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 moving the human uh, quality of life and improving our lives all around the world. It's, it's a great opportunity to be playing this game right now with, with the internet. It's just phenomenal the kind of things that uh, are possible and, uh, and the things that, that one can do from anywhere around the world. This game used to be an exclusive game to Silicon Valley that developing technology and innovation, but it's no longer the case and thanks to the internet. I believe it's almost like the invention of electricity right now. The internet, it just powers everybody around. No matter where you're at, you plug in the wall and you have huge wealth of knowledge. There's unlimited knowledge on the internet. You can teach yourself anything and everything, and great people like you take this opportunity and learn about problems, learn about resources, and create solutions. So it's really a great time to be around what we have going on right now, and you know, if you look at it from a really big perspective. So uh, I, my name is Fadi Bishara, and I'll tell you a little bit quickly about my background. Uh, my talk is called Founder Market Fit. Uh, so I worked with uh, many companies in Silicon Valley, um, originally from Syria. And do we have a remote for this, or is it my name? Uh, we, we're we going to have it. That's OK. We could do this. Uh, so, yeah, born and raised in Syria, I moved to the Valley back in the uh, late 80s and graduated, went to California, um, started uh, three different successful businesses. Uh, the last business I started was, uh, not the last, the second business I started was working with many technology startups around Silicon Valley. So I helped build the teams for a lot of successful companies, and, and it was a fantastic uh, um, privilege, really, to be working with great people who are in Silicon Valley, or people like you. They come from all around the world, like Marco and everybody else comes to the Valley. It's, it's a great weather. I think that's what it is. And it allows people to come in and get innovative and, and, and create stuff. So um, I helped. My, my specialty was uh, building the team, the core teams of these companies, and more than 100 startups that I've worked with and, and learned from. And um, I started Black Box as the last business to help connect uh, global entrepreneurs with all these uh, great resources and the know-how of Silicon Valley. So uh, I do some angel investments, and I do some advising and mentoring. And uh, so that's that's enough about me. Um, we have a program, Pablo mentioned, with uh, Black Box. Uh, I could show you like a two-minute video that describes it. Is there audio for here? This works, right? I love this. That's I'm not sure that maybe works not. so easily. Uh, uh, if it doesn't, we could just pass by. But basically, we have a program called Black Box Connect. We bring companies from all around the world to live together. And we bring uh, successful investors and successful entrepreneurs. Uh, they get to meet and learn intimately from these people. They learn so much about how things work in Silicon Valley, more like, like what is the language and the map of this place, this magic place that has been playing this game for a long time. And uh, by the end of two weeks, basically, they do a demo day and they meet investors. But the goal here is not necessarily to raise funds, although we've managed to take companies after the program and help them in the process beyond that. And uh, we, we've invested in 11 companies right now that uh, uh, nine of them have fundraised and one of them exited. So this is quick video will tell you a little bit about this program, and then I can talk, continue the other thing. Google for Entrepreneurs is our global effort to support and empower startups and entrepreneurs around the world. We talk about Google starting in a garage, and we actually really mean that. We met Black Box Connect with the founder Fadi Bashara a few months ago, and we really believe that their mission and passion really matches our own. The mission of Black Box is to connect entrepreneurs globally with resources in Silicon Valley. The people who are building the Googles and Facebooks and everybody else in, in, in Silicon Valley, they're no different than you are. So we want to help you kind of expand your vision 
think bigger and tackle something global. The model is to bring top founders from different countries here to Silicon Valley, and they provide a really immersive, fun, two-week program. My name is Eddie. And I'm Mursa. We are from Lahore, Pakistan. Hi, I'm Dylan. I'm uh, the co-founder with Stephen on my job and Bono. I'm um, a co-founder at Avocado with George. We come from Cyprus. Hi guys, my name is Steven. We're from South Africa. I'm Octave, CEO of Melzin. Uh, as you can tell from my white skin, this is my first day of sun for the last two, three years. We are basically trying to imagine and appreciate how people interact with smartphones and cameras. We are very passionate about letting users reimagine what they are doing with the devices. Okay, one of the first showcases of our technology is called Groupic. It's an app that lets you take a group picture which includes a photographer. So when the person goes to take the first picture, he comes back and the other goes to take the second picture. And automatically combine those two pictures into a complete group picture. What we want to do is help connect those dots and flows with the know-how of Silicon Valley. One of the good things of Blackbox is that they connect you with different people from all over the world. The other day we had beers with Stephen Chad from YouTube. And they're still so humble, so, uh, so down to earth, willing to help. I think that point here was transformational for me. One of the first things that an investor is going to do is ask them to come in and do a presentation. And so we've armed them with a way to do that in a number of vehicles. I'm Eddie and Gary. Uh, and I think that's a big He said. Yeah. I've seen them improve dramatically on their ability to tell the world what their company is all about. Hi, everybody. I'm Dylan. I'm Michael. My name is Nissan. I believe so we are part of Ideas Lab. One of the first product puts the photographer back in the pictures. We launched the app two weeks ago on the App Store, and we were able to gain attention from a few of the biggest smartphone vendors in the world. Thank you. We released on the end of this month. And we were one of the top 200 apps on the US App Store. After coming here and talking to people, I really helped us refine the story, refine uh, the vision of the company. I am changed. My brain has been reformatted. <laughs> I make some really good friends here. That's not been something that, that will last for a long, long time. I, I've been talking to people for the past 15 months, but, but none of them were this helpful. I believe that we are in a much better position than we were before, before coming to Black Box. I think we are a bit more crazy. <laughs> bit more crazy, so this is what we are good at. We can help entrepreneurs become even crazier human beings. So this is about Black Box. I'm happy to talk about the program and what we do after. I'd like this rest of this uh, <coughs> presentation to be also, if you if you have questions or anything, please feel free to jump in and interrupt me. I like interruptions. I don't like to just be talking myself. So let's do that as it happens. So uh, the, the topic here is uh, uh, what I call founder market fit is what makes what makes the right founder really the right fit for for the right companies. As I mentioned, I've worked with uh, tens of startups, over 100 startups, and I have uh, noticed a pattern about connects certain founders with success. Who are the kind of people? What kind of personalities? And what kind of traits? So I'm um, back. This I use the frame, you know, uh, the phrase uh, founder market fit. I stole it from this. Uh, what's the the most common thing is the product market fit, which is the holy grail of startup. But in essence here is this whole science of entrepreneurship as a management uh, science have been uh, started by uh, some great thought leaders, uh, Steve Blanks and, and, uh, and others. And they talk about these different stages of the company. What are you doing right now? Most of the great companies that I've, I've met today, primarily most of them in that customer in the, in the problem solution fit. Trying to find out that you've already identified a problem and you have an idea how you're going to solve it with a product or a service and you're validating what is the best way to put that out. And the next stage will be the customer validation, which is, like I said, the, the product market fit is what is the the, uh, the holy grail. This is when, when you've created a good product and then you have people coming back and, and buying it again and using it again. That means you've established a space for you in the market. And these are the other stages uh, as company grows in, in this uh, management science. So in, in essence, that you know, it's more like steps here uh, that you're validating the problem in the in the customer discovery stage, and then you're validating the market in the uh, in the second stage, and this is where you're getting the market uh, the product market fit. 
I'm talking about the stage that comes before you start the process. And I think it's really important to think of this, especially for uh, a lot of the great entrepreneurs here, that they're uh, smart and capable, and they're still kind of trying to figure out what is the right thing to, to build. And uh, this is the, the initial uh, phase where, where one should start. And as this, like the customer discovery is what you do, and then customer validation, what I believe that stage is more about the self-discovery. So the, the kind of uh, uh, an interesting thing that, the, you know, what you do in the, in the customer discovery stage is you talk with potential customers. This is when you're in the problem, problem solution phase stage. Uh, when you're in a customer validation stage, this is really when you have a conversation with investors. This is when you find a market you need to scale and you need the venture capital stuff that uh, we've learned how it works uh, from Marco. So this is you bring the VCs once you reach the product market fit to scale and capture more of the market. Uh, the self-discovery, I call it conversation with yourself. So this is really the essence of, of understanding what is it that the, the right thing that you want to do. What are the things that you personally care about? This is the the, uh, the beginning of, of all of that is it's not about choosing a product or choosing a market or saying, okay, I'm going to build this right now. Internet of Things is a hot thing and I need to build some you know, other wearable device or something. It's, it's not uh, going toward building a product or a market because it may be a hot or it may be successful. It's more like start by understanding what are the things that you personally care about, what are the... Uh, I think that they're really your strength. This is typically we're all good at the things that we, we, we like, we enjoy, and this is becomes our strength. Nurture that kind of domain. You know, understand that about yourself. Typically, this understanding comes with just living life and participating and working and all of that. You, you identify from experiences like, I really like finance or accounting or I like design. I, I, I love to you know, make things. It's sometimes, you know, when, when you're studying your, your, your earlier career, you don't have this experience of, you don't have the luxury of really having learned that in life. So what do you do? So that's the more like a reflection, self-discovery about understanding the things that matters to you is a good start. Understanding what you've been good at is, is a good start. And, you know, at, at school people were coming to you to help them with, you know, maybe math, maybe that's where your, your analytics and, and imaginary brain works that way in that space. So just starting from that is sometimes could be a, a, an interesting uh, first step. And then, uh, you know, the things that you care about kind of like by themselves kind of express the things that the problem that you identify that exists right now. <laughs> you, may, you may think there's a problem with the way we do the banking. There's a problem with education. There is a problem with... Um, with the uh, uh, way people connect with each other. Yeah. Whatever you, you, you're you dealing with, whatever issues that might be obvious to you that could be done better, that's a good indication also. Whatever issue that you're frustrated with, these are the, the, the painful uh, areas that it means something to you. You have an emotional connection to it. This, these are the areas that you want to explore more than just what is the potentially going to be a profitable business. Uh, the best product and the best companies that I've seen are, are built by, by uh, founders who really have dealt with the problem themselves. You know, if you take Dropbox as an example, it was file sharing online. We've had this. The idea is not new. The idea existed from the beginning of the Internet. There was iDrive and xDrive and whatever drive and all of these things, store your files on the Internet. None of them worked well. None of them really, they were sluggish, they were slow. Your files may not look the same. Uh, uh, Drew Houston, the founder of Dropbox, was dealing with this problem himself, and he figured out a way that he wanted to build a better file storage system. And Dropbox is worth over ten billion dollars right now, and and this is you know a matter of four or five years or six years of, of development. Uh, most of the companies that I've worked with, most of the founders that I, I've seen really reach bigger success are they were more driven by making a difference by by doing something as you know, Steve Jobs called it, put in a dent in the universe, then making money. The people who were more well, interested in making money, they were the majority of the startups that they would fail. And interestingly enough, the, the ones who didn't care about making the money, they care much more about creating value and making something better in their life. Those are the ones who end up making the most money. 
So start with you know like as as broader and, and larger perspective that you could you could take to understand who you are. There are there are some exercises, there are some ways that you could learn what are the things that you care about. You could think of some of the people who inspired you. Dead alive, it doesn't matter. I don't know, maybe Steve Jobs or Jesus or Mussolini or whoever that might be, or Rama or your brother or whomever that might be. Think of make a list of these people. Who are the people who really you admire and you're inspired by? And then maybe try to figure out what is it about this each one of these people that I appreciate. What is the quality of this, you know, of this person to me? And write those, and then you will discover some patterns about this kind of quality that you're attracted to, that inspire you. Well, the most important thing is these are the quality that you have. You, you're attracted to because of the, the human empathy, because you connect with it, because it's who you are. So these are kind of indication that maybe your strength is being bold and creative and, and, and wanting to change things. So uh, there, there are ways to kind of help you figure yourself out even though you're at, the, at an early stage of building a company. The companies that I've seen being successful, the founder really had some kind of an emotional connection to building a product. Uh, they were doing something they, they care about a lot more than uh, someone else, although it could be in the same space. Uh, we've seen, uh, I failed with uh, your name, with doing the event, uh, uh, the event software to connect people to networking, and your name remind me, you know. So. Okay, yeah. So you know, it's it's just we go building this because he also uh, cares. He's been organizing conferences. He's been doing this, and he understands this pain. Like people come to conferences and events, and they're not making the most value out of it. So the more you understand the issue, the more that you're connected emotionally to what you think is painful and could be more satisfying, and you focus on solving that, your chances of success are typically higher than than the other way around. Uh, you know, expanding this to to a bigger, loftier place and really thinking of what you could do in the world is you can make a difference. I really mean what I just said when I start talking. It is phenomenal where we are at right now in human history. The speed of things are changing is amazing. We have cars driving themselves. We have like the ability that we you know, tap a couple of clicks and we can talk face to face from somewhere around the world. I mean, these things are like now we take for granted. I know the time when you know when we dialed the phone and and then go through and signal was busy and cost so much money if you call someone who was too far or in a different country. Right now, all this shit's gone. You just like a couple of clicks and then the person is right there. I mean, the ability for people to collaborate, the the ability to build product in one country and have it being sold and successful in another country, it's happening every day. I mean, how crazy it is that one company, one product like Facebook has, what's the number? I lose it. What, a billion? A hundred billion? I don't know what that number is. How many How many users this company has? It's amazing. It's the biggest number of customers you can you ever have. I mean, I don't want to offend anybody, but I just had a thought, like, God doesn't have as many customers as users. Yeah, they're users and customers. So having a big vision is really what gets you there. And, and the ability for, for Larry and Sergey of, of Google to say, we want to organize the world information, it's pretty crazy. But it's possible right now. It's OK, and it's possible it, to, to, to really think that you can do I mean, look at the great things that's been done in Italy. I mean, it's the phenomenal architecture and the beauty that you see around. Those were the same crazy people that we have right now. They built like. The massive amount of time it took them and the hard work to make these beautiful sculptures, to build these beautiful, yeah. You know, I mean, I was just looking at what this, where this university is. It's like heaven. <laughs> these people like carved out beautiful space in nature where you can have education. Great. I mean, there's like these are visionary people who thinking big. And now this opportunity is available to all of us, and all of you. And having a big vision is. It's something that you, you know, it's kind of like understand what are the things that, that makes it uh, important to you. 
So uh, you know, building building these kind of companies and building these kind of uh, organizations and creating value on this massive level, it requires a lot of help. This is not an effort one can do alone, and you cannot just do it by you know hiring people. You know, as they they all say, raising a child takes a village. It does take a village. It takes a city. It takes a a lot more to raise also and build a big successful companies. You know, you need all the participating members, the legal people, the investors, and, and the smart people, and, and the people who are going to refer different value creators to you. Your neighbors who say, oh, I know uh, some so-and-so who is building this other company. These random connections. So you need help. When you, when you have a big vision, you need to get a lot of help. So be prepared to be willing to take on the help. And that's not something that you believe that you could do alone. So the thing about help, though, is how are you going to get the help? <coughs> if, if you look at this, it's like there is something in human nature we all like to help. We're born and we're wired with a desire to help. If we, if we see a, a, a child in the park fall off a bicycle, we just you know help her break on the bicycle, and there she goes. And then we feel good. We just like, when we help someone, Despite of who it is, or is, even if it's totally random, you help a blind person cross the street in a foreign country, no one knows you, no one's going to say, oh, okay, fine, good job. No, I'm not doing it because I want to get credit. But when you do it, all of us will do it if we have this opportunity. And then once we do it, it feels good. So it's in our DNA. People like to help. And this is the interesting part. If you have this really big vision and you want to do big things, you need a lot of help. Well, here's the good news. Everybody you see around you, it's in, in their blood. It's, they want to help. But there's, there's a trick here. Who do they help? People tend to help the people that they know first. If, if some big disaster happened right now, and God forbid this building is all on fire and whatever, and we have a, a big helicopter here, and it's collapsing, and and, and Paolo is in a, in a basket here, and he can take you know, four or five people, grab them, and to you know, save them. Which three or four people he's going to pick? He's going to pick the people he knows. So people help the people that they know first. We help our children, we help our spouses, our families, our neighbors. When, when there is a need for help, we prioritize. None of us have infinite amount of resource and time and energy. So when help is needed, we prioritize it. We form small organizations and communities, and we want to help the people that we know. So this is really the logic here. If you follow what I'm talking about, it's kind of the, the interesting argument that I'm making here is uh, to lead to, to uh, a, a point that you know building, building big companies is possible if you really know something that you care about and you understand and you want to solve the problem. It's, it's Don't stop at thinking about it, building a company. Stop, you know, come to it from a place of, I want to change something. I want to make a difference in this X industry. I want to help change the hotel industry. I want to help change cars, how transportation happens. And then you may start by car sharing application. You may start by something. But those experiments along the way, they may fail. But this is not failure. This is learning if you're committed to an area and a space where you feel like this is where you care about personally. So have this big vision, meaning that you need to have a lot of help. Well, human beings are wired for help. And we help the people that we know first. If all of these, if you agree with me on all of these, yeah, no questions so far? We're OK. So if all of these premises are, are Right. Uh, the more people know me, the more help I'm going to get. <clears throat> so you as an entrepreneur, your job is to let everybody in the world know what you're about, what difference you want to make, what impact you want to change, and, and, and what is the value you want to create, and what kind of help you need. And it, people will help you. So the more you're known, the more help you're going to get. The, the, the challenge with this is, especially in Europe, 
and, and many places outside of Silicon Valley, not just Europe, is there's the notion of entrepreneurs who have ideas and big visions, they are have this, this false belief that if they told their idea, someone would steal it. If they talk about what they're about to build, people will 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 think, you know, oh, who you are to do this, or will think that they're arrogant. Or there's association, there's negative associations or fear that is really not accurate and not founded, uh, where it gets in the way of people building and, and creating companies with, with the potential of going for, for a very large vision and, and making something really big. So that's the thing that I, I believe Silicon Valley doesn't have. It's, there are these crazy people who say, we want to do this, and there are other people will come around, and everybody gives everybody else the benefit of the doubts. We trust. You tell me when I go change the entire things, how food is created, how we plant food and consume food, and you have crazy idea when I do that. You have some major serious people with hundreds of millions of dollars behind them listening to you. People willing to see, really, it's their possibilities. We're, we're open to, we've seen these changes happen. So getting, getting the help that you want involves letting the people the world know what you're about, what are you trying to achieve, and being afraid of that could be they steal your idea or something else is, is so small. The probability of that probably 2%. Yeah, there are maybe 2% of assholes out there. But 98% of people are good, and you're going to get a lot of help. Does yeah. it apply to big corporations as well, talking to big companies, established incumbents? Does it apply that big companies that would share what they were going to do? Uh, so, yes, it does. I mean, Jeff Bezos came out a year, six months ago, and says he envisioned that uh, what they want to do is. No, I'm sorry, vice versa. For a startup to talk to absolutely. Jeff Bezos. Absolutely. So, that's another fear is <laughs> I don't want to talk to Google because they may still write my idea. That is the biggest. So the program that we have, we call it Black Box Connect. The code name for me, I wanted to call it Lobotomy for European Entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> taking the evil out, taking these bugs. That's one of the bugs. One of the bugs that they have is thinking like Google is really going to feel threatened by your idea. And, and they're going to say, oh, this is a great idea. OK, five of you, go work on it. It doesn't work that way. Google is happy to share the resources, tell you what they've learned, how what they've learned in this, open up more things, and be willing to support you, and let you do it on your own, your own risk. Let you do it on, you know, that's assuming you're smart, right? You're a smart entrepreneur that you think you may scare Google. Even with that case, they are more willing to help you and stay connected to you. Because it's much cheaper for them and easier for you to validate this, and then they'll buy you. 100 million? 300 do you need? Doesn't matter. I mean, they invested in, uh, in Next, the thermostat company, right? Google Venture invested in Next, and then they bought it for $3 billion. I mean, they don't care. At the time when they feel like there is value to them, that's irrelevant, the, the cost. And they could discover you at the 10, 20, 100 million dollar if there's really value that could be adding, changing, moving a needle, needle for, for uh, Google, they will put the money for it. So definitely share your ideas. Go tell the companies how you're going to take them down. Tell them how you're going to build the next search engine. They will collaborate with you. They will share resources. If you're smart, they, they definitely want to watch what you're doing. But at some point, they know that it's very, very few people going to have the audacity of saying no, 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 no. and then. And then they can compete. I mean, they have the resources. If you get stuff in their way, they can get stuff back. But it doesn't get that far. It doesn't go that direction. So this is uh, the point that I'm mentioning. It's it becomes. It's not who do you know, and it's not what do you. It's not what do you know, and it's not who do you know. It's who knows you. This is what the the common saying. It's not what do you know. It's who know who do you know. It's actually really who knows what you're about. This is the most important thing. The more people know what you're about, the more likely you will get the kind of help that you want. Given that you're doing what you're doing with the clarity and intention of, of creating value for everybody, including yourself and, and all of that. So you need to tell your story, and you need to think big. 
And this is basically the, the uh, what I call the father market. Thing. It's it's people that you know, their makeup, they have a different vision of, of, of the future. They're able to describe this vision in a way other people, they share their story in a way other people get it and understand. They're able to bring a lot of people to help them. And, and often they are ignored and, and misunderstood and, and uh, pushed down and ridiculed. And this is basically, I would just end by something you've already probably also have seen and heard. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So, uh, thank you very much for your time, your attention, and I uh, appreciate it. You're having me now. We take questions for Carlo. Yes, we have time to take questions actually. We have okay. minutes. So, nine minutes. But. So, any question for Fadi? Yes, Chuck, there is a man who's got so, some. Like, right. uh, I've been in the sub team for a long time, and you were talking about. Uh, People were amazingly passionate and care about what they do. Yeah. But uh, you know, I've seen the majority of these people fail. It's good to have passion, but what about the passion and logic balance? <laughs> you know, so they're amazingly passionate about something, but it doesn't make sense. You know, and you're not balancing it out with logic, or you know, solving a real market need. Because the fact of the matter is, most startup founders are not really solving. Yeah, good question. So, so there are a lot of people who their passion can become like so crazy, and, and, and they, they would lose touch with reality, and they go, you know, illogical stuff. So this is uh, definitely I wouldn't take it to that extreme, and I think uh, that might happen sometimes with like one individual. It's if you have good co-founders, the purpose of having good co-founders is to to know the difference where you're hallucinating versus having a vision. The difference between hallucination and a vision is uh, action. So if you're taking action and, and you're moving things forward, that's an indication sometimes that you're on the right track. Yeah, definitely you need to be grounded in reality, but it doesn't mean that you don't <coughs> believe in, in shaking and make it, make it something bigger. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Right. Any other questions? <coughs> yes. Uh, you told us that we should special make the world better place to live. Uh, I have a question about um, this is how they care about this. They look at the other person or they just look at the other people that can earn money? Uh, so VCs, as you heard from Marco, they have, uh, they're, they're very similar to you as an entrepreneur. They have someone else's money and they need to return it. And three, four times. That's their job. And along the way, they have 10 years, and they have process, and they need to give it to entrepreneurs. So otherwise, they would, no one else would give them money. So they need to succeed. So what they care about is making return to the customers. Um, there are good VCs that some of the names that we've heard, different, so the majority of good VCs in Silicon Valley, the most successful, and other VCs that I've met all over the world, the successful VCs always have found this, it's very obvious correlation. Passionate entrepreneurs are more likely to succeed, and they focus on the people. Ideas change all the way. Most companies start with one thing, and they grow and morph into, you know, Instagram started with completely different stuff, right? Investors always invest in in the entrepreneur. Investors don't invest in your company, they don't invest in your Excel sheets, they don't invest in your beautiful graphs and projections, all that bullshit is gone. 
No one talks about business plans. They want to see sometimes business plan to see if you're thinking to some extent logically or you're imagining things too far. But they invest in you as a person. They know it's going to be full of uncertainty and surprises by the time you're going to get to something. They're also willing to do, you know, be wrong at some point. So they invest in you, they want you to win, and they structure deals where they want you also not to be screwed. That's one of the practices that some of the new funds in, in this game that is evolving now and all around the world, where some of the VCs are making more damage than, than good. They have money, they invest in it, but they're taking too, many, too, too big of a piece of the company. By the time the entrepreneur raised a couple of rounds, they have very little equity. They're the one who's really dealing with the pressure of making this thing work and, and, and whatever and get profit. And, and, and then they realize that there's no incentive for them, so they give up. So the VCs that they've been in the game before and they've seen it and they've gotten the, the thousand X return. You know, they invested the you know a million and they get a billion. That's those are the ones who understand that this doesn't come with a straight line. This doesn't come with a predictive methodology. They play these games of, of analyzing and all of that. But if you talk to the most successful VCs and I tell them, how do you make your decision? They'll tell you it's their guts. The good VCs and all of them, they, there's always that's what they driven by. They collect data to, to, to support their argument that I believe in this guy. He's got something that I think may be right here. Yeah, they look at the data. They look at the logic. They look at all these other consideration. You want to cover your basis, but it's all the decisions that us as human beings we make. They're emotional decisions. That's been scientifically proven. We find the data to support the logic, support or what we want to believe in. So VCs are, you know, they're, they're your partners here. But there's a the right time for the right VC and there's the right VC for the right company and not someone because they have money and, and you need money, you should take that money. You need to have that personal understanding that they really see long term with me. They, you, you respect them as an individual and you know that they're going to be a good business partner. It's just like a marriage here. It's going on for many years. You don't know. And it's, it's you know, with very, very certainty, high certainty of, of uh, painful moments and days and months. It's not easy. But it's, it's like some of you mentioned it earlier today. Once you start on this path, it's like there's no return. Once you've identified that you can create your own future, it's become much more difficult to go and to, to do the you know to nine to five or eight to five six whatever it is job. Majority of people who work these jobs they're not necessarily always that you know happy. There's a lot of people who are really you know living only for Friday. What a shame! Spending the most of our lives you know waiting for today's weekend and playing you know for the vacation only. Life's happening right now. So the VCs are, are good, they're not evil. <laughs> <laughs> you have to make money with subs, right? So we had another question there. Ali, what is your core strength? Uh, empathy and connections. And uh, yeah. That's like to maybe the higher level, so I don't know. We have more beer, maybe we get more tea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, the fact that we help people that we know first. Yeah. Um, do you have some tips for approaching people that we don't know to help us? Yes, I do, and and it's by finding ways you can help them first. So people that you don't know that you need their help, that you would like that their help. Find a way, how can I help this person? Understand their pain, their issues. Where do you think you could find a way that you can add value to them? This happens on any level. You can help you know, the highest, most successful other people. Everybody needs help. There's always more things to be done and less time. And you know, you come to me and you tell me that there is this thing that you, you know, you know someone who is to do something that you know that will be valuable for me and you just want to introduce me. And yes, now I'm interested in, it's not like I want to pay you back, but now I appreciate what you've done. And not, you know, and, and I'm, you become someone that I know. 
I'm willing to even know you more. I'm going to spend time with you and learn, you know, who is this nice person who was just out of the blue, out of these hundred people in the crowd, who was thoughtful enough to understand my background and, you know, she's really interesting. I want to know her. And then you build a relationship. Everything in in this game is based on a on a relationship that at the base of it. From relationship you earn trust. When you have trust you can make good agreements and that's how you reach good results. If you want good results, you need to have good agreements. You need to agree that you'll do this, I'll do this, this is the team, this is how we're gonna work. If you don't have trust established, you're gonna start blaming each other. What happened? We didn't do it. Oh, she didn't you were supposed to deliver here. You need trust. If you have a trust, then things happen fast. And trust is not, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't say trust me. I know you can't say, hey, trust. You don't ask for trust. You earn trust. And you earn it by relationship and time. So relationships are the essence of it. You want people to know you start by giving before you ask and, and build a relationship and let them know more about you. Send them you know, a brief email. Here's what I'm working on. You know, if you have any input, they may may not reply. That's okay. But the more they know, you know, don't assume that they maybe you know have time to read novels or something. Yeah. What do you think about the dynamics that happen when you have very recently about this uh, company? Um, yeah. The, um, this company was uh, from last year. It's 20 years old. Uh, Stanford graduate student. That basically raised uh, the highest Series A or C investment. You, you know what I'm talking about. I think so. Yeah, some uh, Clinko, whatever Clinko yes, company. Yeah, yeah that the payment. Uh, so uh, I don't. I mean, what do I think about it? Can, I, can you share a bit more of the story? Because I think oh, so so the the question here is: there's a a, a uh, graduate. I mean, it's like a student at Stanford. Who has uh, raised $25 million in Series A based on a simple prototype that he's built this application that makes payments, people could pay each other money based on uh, uh, high frequency sound as, as the code that connects people. Right now, we have it with emails and verification and passwords. So, like, no, there's a faster way we can do it, and these sounds could be encoded. And, and everybody can pay everybody and smart kid by no by all means probably and, and exposure at Stanford is is key because a lot of you know uh, a lot of you know Yahoo and Google and many other things came out of Stanford. So VCs and other people they have very strong ears to the ground They're sniffing seeing who is the next Zuckerberg in there. So someone could fool them maybe and so it could potentially not always. So what, what happened is this the skip took the money and they hired 20, 30 people and they start and nothing happened. A year later, they're not delivering. The only thing that existed was like the idea and the concept of a prototype, but they never really put a real product out there. The dynamics in the company is a mess, as I read. It's like people don't trust each other. There's a lot of weirdness going on. A lot of weirdness. So that's what I say. Trust your guts. If if it doesn't smell good, something is wrong. And it's not you. Don't think it's, oh, maybe it's me. But you see, basically fooled the investors because that was not a, even a prototype. It was just a video of Mocha. Yeah, I mean, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't know the guy. I haven't talked to any of the investors yet in that, in that the deal. But I don't know uh, what really took place. But to me, it smells like there's some bullshit in here, maybe. So there are people who will maybe try to take advantage of the system. I mean, that's that. Yeah, I mean, I know we live in realistically. There, the people who are always trying to beat the system and cheat and, and cut corners, but I don't think they're the majority. But I don't think we should hold them as the example either. I'll just move on and just focus on all the other good people who've done good things. All right. So that was uh, great, Thank buddy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marco. If you're interested about Slackbox or Mind the Bridge, you just Google them, these names, and you'll find ways how to apply. Thanks. That's great. Uh,
Uh, and uh, we, this is, as I said at the beginning, this is the first um, day for the Tactics Academy or meeting our mentors. Um, the next uh, date will be next Thursday and every second Thursday thereafter. So three more speakers next Thursday. Hope to see you here again and spread the word if you think that this is useful to, to you and your friends. Okay? Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much for